Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today is February 15, 2023, and we are starting our program Momento Brasil uh, with Canal Arbitragem, and we thank Canal Arbitragem for the partnership uh, with the CR Brazil branch in presenting this program that is coordinated by me, Cristina Mastrobuono, and also Cesar Pereira, our former president. I also want to thank Bonassa Advocacia for being our sponsor in this program. Well, today we have a very interesting uh, participation of Anna Gerdau de Borja Mercedo and Noreen Kidunduhu. Uh, we aim to explore the views of arbitration in two different continents, Europe and Africa. I will make a brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Anna Gerdau de Borja Mercedo is a fellow of the Charter Institute, a senior associate at the Reigns and Garavi. She has over 13 years of experience in domestic and international arbitration and holds a an PhD and an LLM from the University of Cambridge. She acted as Council Arbitrator and Secretary to Arbitral Tribunals in Arbitrations under the worldwide most important arbitration institution rules. Her cases have included commercial transactions, joint ventures, large infrastructure projects, M&A deals and projects in real estate and for mining research and exploration. She's a member of the ICC Commission on International Arbitration in ADR in the task force entitled Corruption in International Arbitration and co-coordinator of track five of the same task force. Anna is one of the founders of the Rising Arbitrators Initiative and co-chair of its executive committee and of Delos Long View Steering Committee. And she's a former deputy chair of the Charter Institute's Young Member uh, Group, Global Steering Committee. Noreen, Noreen is based in Nairobi, Kenya, and is a member of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators. She's a common law qualified lawyer who routinely represents clients in both institutional and ad hoc arbitrations under a wide variety of arbitral rules. She has also appeared in court matters related to arbitration. She holds a master's degree in international energy law and policy from the University of Dundee and was in the inaugural cohort of the Africa Arbitration Academy. Noreen is the immediate former chair of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group, Global Steering Committee. Since her admission to the Kenyan Bar, Noreen has been a member of the Law Society of Kenya's Alternative Dispute Resolution Committee, during which she has actively participated in supporting the development of arbitration in Kenya. And she was recently recognized as one of Africa's 30 most promising young arbitrators by the Association of Young Arbitrators. So thank you very much for being here, Noreen and Anna and Cesar for uh, coordinating this program with me. And uh, without further ado, I will start with the questions. And I ask first Noreen. Noreen, you are a lawyer in Kenya and your main field of work is related to energy and natural resources, including environmental issues. You take part in the Energy Charter Secretariat, reviewing investment, climate, and market structure of the energy sector of various countries. What can you tell us about this area in your country? Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And uh, thank you for having me uh, in this, to have this discussion. Um, and just to you know, answer your question about the energy uh, sort of system and sector in, in Kenya. So we are a unique country in the sense that, um, unlike other African countries, most of our electricity uh, is renewable. So currently between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. in Kenya today, um, all the electricity that is generated is actually renewable. And then during the day, um, about 90% of the electricity that we use is, is renewable as well. 
So in a sense, um, unlike other African countries, we're not struggling with the issue of the energy transition or greening our grid because our grid is already largely green. Uh, what the discussions that we are having currently in the country are on how to deco decarbonize the other sectors of our economy. So we are looking at how to decarbonize our transport system, how to decarbonize um, our, our cooking, our industry, our manufacturing, and so on. So the government priorities currently are on um, putting in place policies and incentives that will drive the demand and uptake of e-mobility, for instance, e-cooking, um, we have programs that are supposed to promote energy efficiency and in green buildings particularly. Um, we are having uh, currently feasibility studies on using green hydrogen as an alternative energy source, um, as well as using um, LNG instead of heavy fuel oil for power generation. So, I mean, that's the kind of discussion that we are having in Kenya. We have already sort of greened our, our greed. And so what we are looking at is decarbonizing the other sectors of our economy. Oh, very interesting. And, and when you say it's uh, already a green uh, grid is, and, uh, renew and, and it's uh, renewable energy, is it does it come from uh, water power or solar energy? Is uh, solar energy also explored? So it's a huge mix. We have hydro. Um, we have geothermal, we have wind, and we have solar. So our mix is is uh, mixed between those energy sources. Very nice. <clears throat> so now now turning to to Anna. Anna, you are now for eight years practicing arbitration in big law firms in Paris with cases around the world. What can you tell us about the main concerns in arbitral proceedings nowadays, in your point of view? Thank you for having me. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to participate in this uh, program. Um, yes, yeah, so to answer your question, uh, Christina, uh, I was um, yeah, lucky to study at the University of Cambridge and to have splendid mentors there. I should mention that the late James Crawford, who was the supervisor of my PhD thesis and with whom I, I learned very much, uh, was key to my understanding uh, of, uh, I would say, not the uh, British way, but the Anglo-Saxon way, because he was not uh, British, he was Australian. Also, my um, director of studies at Cambridge was South African, uh, Alan Dashwood. Um, and I would say that perhaps the Anglo-Saxon way would be in, uh, in terms of... Um, uh, legal uh, uh, aspect of uh, the Anglo-Saxon way and also arbitration. I, I would say there is a extreme attention to language and uh, with a special um, focus on the simpli simplicity of language. Uh, to be concise is an art uh, and more difficult than to write in lengthy ways uh, with the, the use of adjectives and adverbs. So. Uh, perhaps concision and economy of languages uh, a key, and that I learned with them. I've learned with them. And the choice of each word and expression is also uh, very important. I recall uh, Crawford introducing me to the book Fowler's, U Fowler's on the use of the English language, which he used to be go through every now and then a few times a day. I thought it was a bit obsessive, but it's a, it's part of the, the Anglo-Saxon way in a way that language and the each word is very important i i practice mostly in english but also in the spanish portuguese and french uh, and when it comes to arbitration it is true that now i'm practicing in in paris not in the in the uk and um, and i it's true that paris is uh, perhaps the me mecca of arbitration uh, if i would uh, if one can say that um and put it that way the level of sophistication uh, of discussions uh, involving arbitration is extremely high, uh, I find, in, in Paris. Um, also, as you know, French law is extremely favorable to arbitration, although it is said to be changing a little when it comes to the control of uh, public policy, international public policy, with decisions uh, related to, for instance, corruption, uh, not corruption of arbitrators, but corruption uh, related to allegations of corruption in arbitration. Um, <clears throat> 
and uh, sometimes what what the last decisions or the most recent decisions of french courts uh, they would go so far as to uh, accept new evidence at uh, at the uh, at in proceedings for uh, uh, setting aside proceedings or recognition and enforcement proceedings and would go and sort of review the merits uh, with respect to those allegations of corruption again in a way uh, even if one of the parties has not raised corruption during the arbitral proceedings um, so this is a, a, an important development that has been uh, to a certain extent criticized by french practitioners uh, this is French uh, court development, not uh, necessarily uh, representing the, the idea or the vision of French arbitration practitioners. And uh, to say, I mean, the difference is perhaps, I wouldn't say there is a big difference um, in the terms of how we practice arbitration, because uh, as you know, in international arbitration, it's become a bit uniformized <laughs> in a way. So I, I would find that we practicing in London or in Paris or in New York or in uh, Geneva, in international proceedings, I'm not uh, speaking for domestic proceedings, then <laughs> it's, a different, it's a little bit different depending on the country. But yes, I wouldn't see any uh, much of a difference except for one thing that I find that sometimes happens in the cases involve, involving Anglo-Saxon uh, practitioners is that sometimes they use barristers to do oral pleadings to participate in the hearing. So a solicitor does most of the case and then suddenly just before the hearing they appoint uh, a new, I mean an additional um, counsel to do the pleadings. That I've seen, uh, but not often. I mean, sometimes it, it may happen. Okay, thank you very much. Cesar, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Christina, and especially for the partnership in the uh, organization in, 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 in the uh, in all the, the, the work related to this uh, CIR moment uh, at arbitration channel and um, before we uh, we move on I would like just to quickly ask uh, Anna a follow-up question on what you just said I, I believe you are referring to the all so-called Alstom saga right uh, the, the the recent decisions regarding corruption and public policy. But uh, do you, uh, just very quickly, do you see that as a trend, uh, as, as something that represents uh, how French courts see allegations of corruption in arbitration or, or, the, or issues relating to corruption in arbitration? Or is that uh, maybe an outlier? Is that a, 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 a case that does not represent, uh, let's say, a French approach to that issue? Yes, it's difficult to say. There are quite a f there. Are, there's been there have been a few decisions, not only on the Alston case, but especially also on the there's Bellocon case uh, that relates to investment arbitration. But nevertheless, I mean, in the end, the logic is the same uh, with respect to allegations of corruption. Um, I see that there is a current trend. I'm I, I'm not sure whether this will remain or persist in the future. To come <laughs> it is difficult to predict but it's been very much criticized and and some colleagues of uh, french colleagues of mine said oh maybe i will not uh, propose that paris is the seat of arbitration <laughs> for my clients because of this risk but in the, at, at some point i mean at the same time uh, to have a clean and I, I mean a clean arbitration without corruption i think it's good so uh, when it comes to corruption, I would I don't think it's the only problem with the approach that was taken by the Paris Court of the uh, Court of Appeal and the Coup de Cassation is that they um, that was confirmed by the Coup de Cassation is that they review uh, the merits again in this respect and also even if the party does hasn't raised it and maybe for French lawyers it's a bit shocking. Because normally there is the loyalty, like procedural loyalty that you have to, I mean, you can't just uh, take uh, <laughs> something out of your hat in, uh, later on, you know. Uh, um, but um, I, it's difficult to say whether this will persist, to answer your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And uh, Noreen, uh, turning to you, um, I'd like to ask you a question about the status and the uh, uh, developments of arbitration in, in Kenya. Uh, 
It, uh, are arbitration agreements used in all sorts of contracts or mostly in international deals uh, only? Um, for um, another issue, uh, are state entities allowed to use arbitration? Uh, how do you see uh, Kenya in the context of other African countries uh, in this regard? I, I understand uh, countries such as Nigeria and Zambia, for instance, are very active in uh, the submission of state parties uh, to commercial arbitration. And so uh, how do you see Kenya in that context? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, just to, you know, to set sort of the background. So we promulgated a new constitution in 2010, which made ADR a constitutional imperative. So between 2010 and now, we've seen, of course, the uptick of mostly, mostly ADR alongside, you know, our judicial system. Um, and for example, our judiciary has been very keen to uphold arbitration agreements, but also to enforce awards that have been brought to Kenya um, for enforcement. But the judiciary has also developed um, court annexed mediation, which basically when cases are filed in our courts, they are screened to ensure, to confirm that they can uh, be mediated. And if they can, um, they are sent to a court accredited uh, mediator for mediation within 60 days. Um, if they do not reach a settlement, uh, then the matter now goes into the court system. So we can see that the judiciary um, in Kenya is uh, open and agreeable to ADR mechanisms. But beyond that, we have seen, you know, the growth of uh, international commercial arbitration, as well as domestic, domestic arbitration in the region. We have now a Nairobi Center of International Arbitration that um, sits in Nairobi uh, and takes up international arbitration matters. We have a CIR branch, uh, Kenya here, which of course undertakes trainings, but also appoints um, arbitrators from the region um, to take up domestic arbitration. So we've seen that as well. And across the continent, we are also seeing an uptick of arbitration generally. We've seen countries like um, Nigeria, countries like Sierra Leone, amending and revising um, their framework for arbitration. Um, we've also seen the mushrooming of arbitral institutions. There are currently 91 arbitral institutions in the um, African continent. Of course, the main ones are in Cairo, you know, the one in Rwanda, Mauritius, um, the common uh, court of justice and arbitration for the Ohada region as well. So um, that already shows that there's an uptick of arbitration in the region. Um, but when it comes to framework as well, we can see like the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement um, puts in place mechanisms for resolution of interstate disputes through arbitration. Um, and SOAS also had a study last year that showed that many African um, respondents said that they have a bias for dispute resolution and particularly arbitration for inter-African disputes. So the, the continent is, is very open and willing to take up arbitration um, in, in the space. And I don't know if you're aware, also the Africa Arbitration Academy developed a model BIT for African countries, which of course enshrines arbitration as well. So across uh, domestic and international arbitration, we can see frameworks being put in place. We can see institutions uh, coming up and rules, um, and of course model BITs that enshrine arbitration in the African space. Thank you, uh, Nori. Uh I, 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 just to your last point there, um, my understanding from what you said is that uh, when states are involved, the focus is basically uh, treaty-based arbitration, right? Uh, BITs and I, uh, the Inter-African um, uh, Initiative uh, it is also uh, related to treaty uh, arbitration, not... Uh, commercial contract-based arbitration, is that correct? That's correct. But not to say that arbitration is not also uh, being adopted by commercial parties. So a lot of the contracts right now, um, because of the foreign direct investment coming in, uh, and parties that of course um, are either registered or have registered companies here, we see there's a lot of um, international commercial uh, arbitration that is also happening, but also most domestic commercial contracts also just have um, arbitration agreements within them. So a lot of the dispute resolution clauses that we are seeing in contracts right now are um, promote arbitration. Thank you. And uh, Anna, uh, back to you. Now, uh, 
I, I understand you have a lot of experience in infrastructure contracts. And so uh, from the cases uh, you have been involved uh, with, uh, can you uh, maybe uh, point out some of the main reasons for disagreement between parties in, a, in, a, in an infrastructure contract? Can you say whether there, is, there are different interpretations of the contract or, uh, or contracts should be drafted better? Um, do you think there should be maybe a greater interaction between litigation lawyers and transaction lawyer, uh, transactional lawyers uh, to prevent future, future damage, uh, disputes? Uh, so how, how do you see that in your practice? Um, uh, thank you for that's a good question. I, I would see as the main reason for disagreement in infrastructure dispute um, as being uh, often lack of communication uh, between the parties or poor communication uh, and um, as you mentioned poorly drafted or unclear contractual provisions. Um, also sometimes uh, disagreement um, comes from, Uh, a party, let's say, no longer having interest in the transaction for commercial reasons. Uh, for instance, uh, there might be political changes or currency fluctuations that make that uh, the contract uh, makes no sense in terms of what was the price and what was agreed on. Uh, so it can vary, but uh, what I see is uh, this normally. Thank you, and I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned as the first reason uh, the uh, lack of communication. And um, uh, uh, do you see a, a growth in the use and uh, the effectiveness of mechanisms such as, as dispute boards or mediation in, in infrastructure contracts? Uh, uh, that's, uh, those are generally thought uh, of as, as forms of enhancing uh, communication and maybe uh, preventing uh, problems like the ones you mentioned. Uh, yes, well, as, as you mentioned in the, in the question, of course, first, when drafting the contract, of course, if, if there's a good interaction between uh, transactional lawyers and dispute lawyers, they might come to uh, 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 more precise and uh, less ambiguous uh, terms. But then, of course, when the contract has already been concluded, <laughs> then I, I would uh, I would say that what I see for infrastructure, especially because these are often long-term contracts, I find that uh, more than mediation, actually, this billboard would be very suited, especially because, well, I would... Um, the type of these billboards that are standing these billboards, not the ones that are set up later on during the life of the contract, but those that already... Um, they are set up uh, just after the con contract is concluded and then they will be um, deciding on the smaller <laughs> disputes uh, of fur et à mesure, as they say in French, like uh, during the life of the contract so that it doesn't become uh, a snowball. <laughs> what we say in Portuguese, that's an expression. So they, they and, and what I see from the statistics is, is that um, very often the disputes are solved, I mean, uh, by way of uh, the recommendations or dispute board uh, decisions, uh, and uh, there is no arbitration. So it prevents going so far as arbitration, and finally, probably it's a more efficient uh, way uh, for long-term uh, infrastructure contracts. Thank you, yeah, thank you. Just, That's very enlightening. Oh, please, uh, Noreen, go yeah. ahead. No, I just wanted to chime in. So what, what I've seen on our end, other than, you know, the dispute boards and the mediation uh, pre-arbitration is um, sort of expert determination so that the matters mm -hmm. that can just be taken to the experts go to the experts. And then if they disagree, then finally we have arbitration. But also having those multi-tiered dispute resolution clauses where, you know, you negotiate fast or there's mediation between the CEOs of, the companies before finally uh, we go to arbitration. But I found it very interesting, Anna, that lack of communication is actually a big issue in, in those types of contracts. And, and Noreen, uh, since you, uh, you, you gave us this information now, uh, is adjudication uh, a, a, a common form of dispute resolution in Kenya? Uh, do you follow the, uh, let's say, the UK tradition 
of adjudication in, in construction contracts, uh, which is not present in many other countries. Uh, do, so do, do you do adjudication as well? Yeah, it's now becoming common in our larger infrastructure projects to have adjudication. Uh, but for the domestic sort of infrastructure projects, we have our own sort of, um, it's called the Joint Bidders Council. It's a template contract that usually provides for arbitration, but before the arbitration, it provides for uh, negotiations or sort of mediation between the parties, which if it fails, then um, now you proceed to um, arbitration. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christina, back to you. Thanks. Yes, uh, I just want to comment uh, uh, quickly about what Anna said. So the lack of communication between parties and I can give my experience of being in a dispute board that it really helps in this sense of being um, a monthly forum or every two months where parties sit together and the dispute members, they ask uh, what's going on, is there a dispute arising, is there something you are not agreeing upon? And well, my experience so far is that it's really a good um, tool to be used in these long-term contracts. But uh, what you said, not the ad hoc uh, dispute board, but the one that's from the beginning on, and it, it, I think it's very useful. But anyway, um, Noreen, I, I would love to go back to the energy uh, matters to discuss with you, but um, since time is short and you were uh, the, you are the, the former um, chair of the Young Member Committee of the Charter Institute, I want to hear your thoughts about that, to know how was it to be in this position, uh, what was, what's your experience in that? Yeah, um, first I have to say I was very lucky to have Anna as my deputy because we sort of created a symbiotic relationship um, that, that, that we leverage on our strengths, on each other's strengths. So, you know, Anna is very detail oriented. Um, I'm a person of the larger picture. So we, we work very well together and it was a beautiful experience to have with her. But um, in terms of what we needed to do, um, it was both challenging and gratifying. I remember one of the first issues Anna and I had to deal with was um, at the cusp of the Ukraine and Russian war. And it was whether to involve our Russian counterparts and members in our activities. Um, and it was it was quite a, a decision that we had to make and we had to do, you know, back and forth calls and involve everyone in the committee to just understand how best to deal with that with that uh, situation. But also we found ourselves in what I can call the new era of the committee, because for the first time ever, we had the largest um, diversity in terms of our members. And it was also the largest committee. So about 18 of us from virtually every continent. Um, and so it was the first time that we, we had that kind of committee. And because of that, we needed to put in systems in place that would you know, take into account that sort of diversity and that number uh, and all the ideas that came with. Before that, we didn't actually have structures basically because the committee was very small, but also because we were also in a particular region. So one, some of the things that we managed to do with Anna is um, finalize the revision of the rules. So now the YMG steering committee has, you know, rules um, that, you know, take into account uh, the growth that the committee is going to see um, in the future. What we also tried to put in place was um, the YMG ambassadors with, who are representatives um, for the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, but in areas where um, CIAB does not have a branch or a chapter. Um, we also increased um, interactions between the different YMG branch chairs with the Global Steering Committee because before that um, the branch chairs were doing their own thing and the Global Steering Committee was doing its own thing. So now there's um, a way for the two parties to communicate. Um, and then we also have a social media presence that is solely dedicated to YMG. Before that we were relying on CI Hub HQ to put out content for us um, and also just let our members know what we're doing and our activities in place. Um, and so what basically Anna and I did was do a lot of streamlining and put you know structures in place that will now um, assist um, CI Hub YMG uh, with now the, the larger diversity that they have and the number of members they have 
to influence um, the work that we do in the smaller YMG branch groups. Well, I think you did a very, very good job, you both. Congratulations. <laughs> yes. And well, turning to Anna. Um, Anna, you, uh, your resume shows that you have a lot of activities. So not only uh, you perform your duties in arbitration proceedings, you work as a lawyer, but you also take part in a lot of initiatives like the test forces of ICC commissions and in the creation of the Rising Arbitrators Group. And I also know that you're a mother. So uh, how can you handle all, all of these activities? Uh, a, thank you. Thank you, Christina. It's a good question. <laughs> and thank you, Noreen, for your kind words. Yes, uh, I, I was very privileged to have Noreen as a chair if I may add, uh, uh, she was uh, been a fantastic chair, uh, uh, also a great leader and a courageous leader. So uh, <laughs> it was a pleasure. Um, yeah, so uh, to say uh, how I'm able to reconcile <laughs> yeah, uh, some uh, institutional, let's say, activities and uh, other activities uh, um, uh, of our profession. Um, I think that I would say one has to be extremely organized and efficient because I have less time. I have less hours in my day <laughs> for a good reason, because I have two uh, children of a, um, a very young age, uh, three and one. Um, so um, I would say, yes, organized, being organized and very efficient. Uh, also, I, it's important to have a good sense of priorities uh, because uh, and to learn to say no sometimes, because uh, one can't do everything well. Uh, and uh, I'm someone that if I say yes, I will do it well. Uh, otherwise, I prefer saying no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or if I'm uh, to accept something, then it's best that I'm very active. Otherwise, it's, I prefer not participating. Uh, and that I have been... Uh, uh, listening to also i have good advice from my husband <laughs> who has been also he has he's very active in his career he's not a lawyer uh, and he's always, he always tells anna you have to focus uh, because i have less time i have to focus and um especially on the um, jurisdictions i i re which are relevant for me um so uh, that uh, is probably the the secret <laughs> or uh, not a secret it's just probably obvious <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Cesar, please. Uh, thank you, Anna. And uh, well, I, I I take your words very seriously. Those uh, about uh, learning to say no and focusing, and uh, those are extremely important things uh, because uh, today uh, there are so many uh, different opportunities all over the world. If you if you decide to to uh, attempt to take all of them uh, or to take uh, many of them, you're just lost. And so, yeah, th those are very important advices. And uh, well, before we close, I would like to just hear both of you uh, on a, a final topic. It has to do with something that Noreen uh, mentioned a while ago about your work uh, at the YMG and the growth of the committee and how diverse it became. Uh, we all know there is a great deal of concern that the pool of arbitrators uh, should grow and be more diverse. And age is uh, always a, a factor uh, alongside uh, uh, gender, race, geography, to name just a few. And uh, from your experience uh, at the uh, YMG, the Young Members Group, uh, what is really effective to promote age diversity among decision makers? Uh, what is your view on the efforts to promote diversity in general as well? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Noreen, and then Anna. Yeah, um, it's it's very interesting this age age issue when it comes to international arbitration because a couple of the reports that we have seen, especially from the ICC, shows that the average age of arbitrators they appoint is fifty six. So, for instance, for me, I'd need at, at least another sixteen or something years before, and I the ICC recognize or you know are able to give me an appointment. So there's, there's that issue where senior practitioners are thought to be, have more knowledge or probably wisdom when it comes to delivery of 
uh, awards or just in the arbitration space. Um, and yet studies have shown, and there's a study I think by Dr. Stacy Strong that shows that um, as we grow older, we do not change our reasoning. So the, there's actually no logic for us to appoint older practitioners as opposed to younger ones, because our reasoning really doesn't change um, throughout the years. We may of course gain a bit of experience and some wisdom, but ultimately our reasoning stays the same. And that of course is just a reason enough to, to you know, for institutions to realize that they do not have to appoint the older uh, arbitrators or older practitioners in their matters or even as counsel. What I have seen effective, um, particularly with institutions, is for them to have a reserve list that uh, that accommodates um, practitioners either who have not sat as arbitrators before or are still new in the profession. And each time they're asked to appoint a tribunal, they ensure that the tri they pick someone from the reserve list to sit with the experienced um, arbitrators so that they can now learn and even gain experience. Um, we have the same in CI Ab Kenya for our domestic arbitrations. We have a rule of neutrals and another rule of honor where uh, new practitioners or members and fellows um, are listed on that list. And every time you know someone needs to be paired up or a tribunal needs to be set up with an older or more seasoned practitioner, um, both, uh, uh, both parties are paired. Um, the other thing I think that might be, you know, important is for institutions to also have granular data of, you know, the practitioners that they appoint or the arbitrators that they appoint, so that it's very clear where the gaps are, what incentives and policies we need to do, but also what progress we are making, because we can have this discussion, but we're not really making progress. But if we have granular data um, from these institutions, we're able to see, okay, these are the number of uh, young arbitrators we appointed last year or who appeared before um, um, uh, the kind of, you know, appeared in matters that have rules with the different institutions and what we can we can do better. Thank you, Noreen. And it's very interesting what you said about this uh, granular uh, data, uh, the uh, lack of empirical data uh, many times is uh, uh, is a, a, a difficulty in in promoting uh, progress, and uh, in, in in on the other hand, the transparency of those data uh, creates uh, some type of uh, public awareness of the situation that in itself is a drive to change. Right? And so, it's uh, very important to have that data, to have those data, and to uh, make them available and and, and make them uh, public. Uh, thank you. And uh, Anna, uh, Anna uh, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, uh, I tend to agree with Noreen. Uh, uh, and I would just add one thing. Uh, I think to promote age diversity, one needs to give opportunities at young age. Because in any case, even... I mean, one thing is reasoning. Also, one thing that is required from arbitrators is case management skills. And one can only be an excellent arbitrator if one has been exposed to uh, this uh, experience. So uh, to uh, promote uh, age diversity, one has to also promote giving opportunities at a young age. Uh, and so, so that one can offer the right tools to young practitioners to perform a good mandate, mandate as arbitrator, uh, because without opportunity and experience, it cannot work because parties expect uh, excellent uh, management skills also not only uh, of course legal skills but also like one has to handle the proceedings and and be brave enough to decide not decide too swiftly sometimes just have sometimes good to sleep on it and the next day but um uh, it's very important to be agile and and take uh, good decisions not to please the party <laughs> necessarily but uh, uh, because one ends up not ple displeasing both parties if one does that but um, uh, this is like uh, skills that are acquired through being uh, acting as counsel or acting as secretary to tribunals or uh, at an arbitrary institution, seeing how uh, from the you know, ba uh, background, how, how it works. And I think that uh, that probably helps a lot if one becomes an arbitrator and then one can become an arbitrator being uh, very confident that one masters the skills. Uh, otherwise, it can be a stressful, uh, especially a uh, job, because 
very often young arbitrators are appointed as sole arbitrators or in cases, the small cases where parties sometimes there are defaulting parties and sometimes counsel is not as exper experienced. So it requires ex a bit extra, <laughs> uh, you know, savoir faire and uh, uh, as I said, case management skills. And, and of course, what, it's good to also have good mentors. Uh, when can when does they need to give details? But sometimes good to discuss with uh, people have that um, have more experience than you. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's very good, and it, it's uh, it's just interesting how uh, it's at least in domestic cases, in, in small cases, it's uh, often the case that uh, our, our institutions will appoint younger arbitrators for those positions. And as I said, many of those cases are very complicated because they have all these. Uh, inherent uh, difficulties and um, uh, the awareness, I think, of, of those difficulties um, is important so that our, our arbitration institutions can provide support to the, these uh, younger arbitrators, uh, maybe having some type of uh, like group of, of, of more experienced arbitrators available to discuss with them uh, uh, things related to case management, for instance. And so I, I think the awareness of that is very important in, in, in the, the notion that institutions play a role in developing a larger pool of arbitrators and in, in, in promoting diversity. And thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we have come uh, to the end of our uh, time. It's uh, unfortunate that we cannot go on uh, for, for much longer uh, discussing with you because th that would be wonderful. I would like to thank again uh, Noreen Kidunduhu. Is that how, we, how I say your last name? Perfect. <laughs> okay. And uh, Anna Gerdau Borja Mercerou. Uh, and uh, it, it's been a pleasure having you here. Again, uh, thank you, Christina, for the, the partnership. Uh, I would like to thank once more uh, Arbitration Channel in F. Bonassa. Advogados, uh, our sponsor, and invite uh, all of you to our next episode, which will be on March the 1st, uh, relating to arbitration with state parties in Brazil. We will have with us uh, uh, two of the most prominent uh, um, Brazil uh, uh, federal government uh, attorneys uh, in Brazil uh, involved in state uh, commercial arbitration uh, in Brazil, and that will be a, a good opportunity to discuss this topic. And um, also, I would like you to visit uh, the uh, CIR Brazil uh, branch uh, website and uh, arbitration channel website to learn more about one very interesting uh, program that we will put together on March the 8th. Uh, with uh, uh, this moot round, a, de a demonstration round uh, between a uh, Brazilian uh, university and a uh, team uh, based on chat GPT, uh, inter artificial intelligence, uh, an artificial intelligence uh, software. And so that uh, we will have this uh, human versus machine uh, dispute in uh, that promises to be very interesting to watch. So I would like you to all to, uh, to be there and witness uh, this, which seems to be the fir a first in the arbitration world so far. So thank you again and see you next time. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you, Noreen. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>